if someone said to you, and you've got such a rich history with Barry, if some stranger walked up onto you on the street and stopped you and said, what's your first memory of Barry? Or not your first memory, what do you remember about Barry? If I say Barry University or Barry College, you, what comes to your mind first? Life-changing experience. For you or for the college? <laughs> no, not for the college. <laughs> well, but the college has gone through a lot. Well, it has, but you, you asked me what my memory yes, is. Yes. And my memory would be the the impact that my undergraduate education had on me as a person. And the fact that I believe that the sisters, because the faculty at the time was largely our sisters, that they had a keen sense of tapping into students' potential and drawing that out. And that's what they did for me. I, I had been a leader in high school. Uh, they didn't know me at all when I came as a, when I came as a, as a, a freshman. And I was immediately drawn out given leadership positions, and then nurtured um, through the elected positions that I held when I was a student here. Uh, obviously, my education was, was phenomenally rich, and ultimately, this is where I found my life calling. I mean, I didn't come expecting to be a sister, but I think it was all part of the milieu, and I, and I think that's still here now. I do. I think Without the, the sisters. Without the sisters, but the legacy of the Adrian Dominican sisters lives on in the women and the men who choose to work here, whatever their role. I, I do believe that we, that we are a student-centered university. I, I hear the stories every day from students who talk about how their life was changed or who is in their life here at the university, faculty member, a staff member, how they pay tribute to them, and the care, the concern, uh, that's reflected in, in a myriad of ways, whether it's encouragement or stimulation or challenge or you know, uh, calling you to be more than you think you are. I think that's a part of, of what Barry is and, and who Barry is, because Barry is the people. So. Uh, you're, um, uh, everyone I spoke to and Adrian, who, who taught you here, to a person they said, you know, when you met her, you knew she was going to go places. <laughs> you were a student government leader, you were out there, you were fighting for things, or you spoke up and you said your mind, and they recognized at Barry that you were just, you were going to be something special. Oh, that's nice to hear. Uh, that's nice to hear. But, and and I, I love that experience. You know, I, I look back on those four years and I have great memories. I, I say that to the students. The four years or the five years, whatever it is now, because they take fewer credits than we took, most of us came and in four years we graduated. Those years don't come back again. And they may feel they're very stressed, but I always say to them, believe me, you know, you're going to look back and think, wow, those were great years. Uh, I, I, I didn't know how free I really was. So uh, that's what college life is supposed to be for young people. This is a time of transition into young adulthood. So I loved it. I, my friends from, from those Barry years are still my friends. You said when you came here, you had not planned to live a vowed life, right? Did Barry, did, did Barry was Barry the, the instrument that made you decide to do that? or No, the sisters. The, the, the sisters here, though. It, it was the sisters here. So you decided while at Barry? I decided in my senior year. I, had, I, I was thinking about this because someone asked me this question a little while ago. I think as a young child, because. I went to Catholic school. I went to Catholic elementary school, grammar school, as we called it then. I went to an all-girls academy, Catholic all-girls academy. Um, we were always taught to uh, pray that we would know what it was we should do with our life. So when I think back to my youth 
and my high school years and even here at Barry, that was a part of my prayer life. You know, God, let me know what I'm supposed to do with my life. And I, it became clear when I was a senior. It was not, sisters tell very different stories about their vocation. For me, it was not, oh, I love that habit. I can't wait to wear it. It was, this is what God wants me to do with my life. And I only knew the Adrian Dominican sisters for four years. I had had two other groups of sisters growing up in New York. It never entered my mind to join them. It was always the women I met here. They were bright. They were well-educated. They were strong in their convictions. They made themselves live for us, but they were joyful. They had smiles on their faces. And right here in this office, this was their dining room. This whole area, because that wall is new, this was what was called the sisters' refectory. The rest of Lavoie Hall, first floor, was our dining room. We never walked along the perimeter of these walls. That was called cloister walk. And the sisters had chairs out here. And after dinner, before they would go to night prayer, they would sit out here and we would leave the dining room and go to our dorms, as we called them in those days, or we would be going to the library and we could hear them laughing. And I thought they were joyful. And I had no idea that St. Dominic was called the Joyful Friar. I didn't know that the Adrian Dominicans were known for that, that they were joyful women. So I think they were instruments, if you will, of God's call to me. And it was, it was not like, you know, wham, on the side of my head. It was a, a growing awareness that this is it. Were there any sisters in particular? I'm sure you love them all, but are there one or two that really stood out that to, to, you will remember them forever? Forever. Sister Nadine Foley, who at the time was Sister Thomas Aquin, and uh, Sister came when we were sophomores, and I, t in those days, we took 15 credits of philosophy, so I had a number of philosophy courses with her. I also was very active in the Sodality, which was a very large organization here on the campus. And she was the advisor to the Sodality. Um, when Jack Kennedy was elected president, we created a national organization here at Barry called the Presidential Prayer Corps, the PPC. And we had college, Catholic colleges and universities all over the country join that. Because he was the first Catholic president, we were going to support him with prayer. Didn't matter whether you were Republican or Democrat, Independent, that was not the issue. It's that he was a very young president, and so we created the PPC. And Sister, um, now Nadine Foley, but at the time, Sister Thomas Aquin um, was the advisor to the Sodality, so the two of us basically created that national organization. And I know that she was the most significant influence on my life. How? Oh. Um, oh, why? I saw, I saw a very um, holy woman who was probably a genius in terms of her intellectual capacity, and yet was able to balance that gift with being available for 
these uninitiated scholars, if you will, and really investing herself in our education. I genuinely liked her to begin with. She's by nature a very quiet, shy person. And I was drawn to her. And, and so I began to nurture that relationship. And I, as I said, I think she was the primary reason that I even began to think about it. I think a vocation at its core is about a relationship. And ultimately the relationship of your, yourself to God. But you're brought to the depths of that relationship, I believe, at least for me, through other people. Uh, Sister Arnold, loved Sister Arnold. Um, Sister Trinita was my dean when I was a student. And, and now that once I joined the congregation and grew, if you will, into the history of Barry at that time, I know the sisters had enormous challenges while they were here. I know they had some struggles around who was in charge, but they never played that out in front of the students. At the time, could you, and I'm sure you're going to say no, but could you ever have envisioned you would return to Barry eventually? Well, first as dean, I mean the dean, but of students, but then ultimately the, the best job in the world. Did you ever imagine you'd return as president? Never. <laughs> Never. I thought I was going to teach first grade for the rest of my life. <laughs> I mean, when I, that's, I, you know, I was prepared to be a teacher. I did my student teaching at Miami Shores Elementary School in fourth, I had fourth grade. And then when I entered, uh, because I had a degree, even while I was a postulant, which is now what we call a candidate, I was sent out to teach. So I didn't stay at the mother house the whole time. I was sent to teach first and second grade, and thank God it was a neighborhood school because all the children came in once we got to the convent after summer was over. So I brought all the children into the classroom and I had them help me unpack the boxes. And I'd say, and what did sister do? What did sister use this for? And how would sister use these? Because all of the materials and aids were there, but. I had done my student teaching in fourth grade. What did I know about primary? Nothing. So basically, I taught first and second, and then we all had to go back for our novitiate, which is a year long. The day I made first profession, I was missioned to a school in a suburb of Detroit teaching first grade. And then I did that until 1969, and in those days, we would get a card in the mail that would say, you are hereby assigned to, and mine said, you are hereby assigned to Barry College. I couldn't believe it. I was 28 years old. And that's when I came back here in student affairs. It was seven years after I graduated, so. You went from first grade to a college. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes when I look at the students, especially when they come as freshmen, I think to myself, mm-hmm. I knew what you were like as a first grader, <laughs> especially the boys. They're, they're always much easier to look at. And, you know, they, they were always much easier, quite frankly, to teach. But <laughs> what would you like your legacy to be? How do you want to be known here at Barry University? The demographics of our congregation are very clear. We're getting ready for a new general chapter where we set a mission and uh, really a vision for six years. And in preparation for that, we've looked at our demographics. So we're all very aware of 
who we are, the ages of our women, the fact that in the minds of some of our sisters, I am a young nun. <laughs> I mean, they don't think of me as an older sister, and yet I'm two years past my golden jubilee. And so it's clear to me there, there is not a cohort or a cadre of women, Adrian Dominican sisters, who are going to continue to serve the mission and the core commitments of Barry University. And so I have made a, whether I am the last Adrian Dominican president or not, I think it's, it's important for me to put in place programs, services, and people to help all of us grow in our understanding of the mission of this university, of the values that underpin it, and most especially the core commitments. What does it mean to be a university that's Catholic Dominican, but sponsored by the Adrian Dominican sisters? Even if there were no sisters here, I believe that that legacy can perdure through the women and men who make a commitment to work here. So you're saying, saying if I, that your mission is to create your legacy, if you will, is to um, transition, effectuate a transition that is almost likely that you will be the last. I don't know that I will be. But, but there are women, question, if not, there, there, yes, I, I don't, you know, there are women who have experience in higher education who are prepared at the doctoral level, whether that's their choice or whether it's a board choice. For me, whether that happens or not is, is not the, the key factor. Because I don't think a president is the sole arbiter of faithfulness to mission. I believe it's everyone's responsibility. But it is the president's, at least it is my responsibility, to prepare for the future. And so that's why the creation of the division of institutional and mission effectiveness was very important to me. I wanted to do that. The creation of the Mission Integration Council, the Mission Effectiveness Council at the law school, um, the Office of Mission Engagement, taking members of our university community to the mother house, um, articul having conversations and dialogues throughout the year on the understanding of our mission and its relationship to the mission of the Adrian Dominican sisters. That's important to me. Can Barry be Barry without a Catholic sister? Is what you're saying? Well, I, I know that there are many Catholic colleges and universities in our country right now without, that were founded by women religious that don't have women religious working full time in them. But will Barry be Barry? Because Barry has always, unlike the others, Barry has always had, even Sienna Heights did not, Barry has always had an Adrian Dominican nun as president. I have great confidence in people who choose to work here. I do. I, I see so many expressions of the mission here in the women and men. And, and it has nothing to do with their identified faith tradition. But it has everything to do with understanding what it means to be Barry University. Understanding its history its heritage, heritage, its charism, a lot of which is shaped, was shaped, and thank God continues to be shaped by the Adrian Dominican sisters. I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of that future. I'm not. I see too much evidence of, uh, in the lives of the people who work here. 
I mean, when you think about the church, the Catholic Church, uh, it's really the lay women and men who are who are the expression, if you will, of the true meaning of the church right now. I mean, there are parts of this country where there's no resident priest, where lay women and men prepare families for the sacraments, prepare couples for marriage. I mean, that you go to parts of, in the Southwest and other parts of the country, that's the norm. So I think here at Barry, we're already seeing evidence of the assumption of leadership in that regard by the women and men who work here to varying degrees. You know, there, there's the Office of Mission Engagement. That's their primary focus. But it is not just them, and it's not just the members of Mission Integration Council or the Mission Effectiveness Council at the law school. It's all of you. <laughs> Even knowing the mission or, or an aspect of the core commitment, the, the way I see the engagement of our students in all of the leadership programs and the outreach programs, the service learning initiatives, the student engagement, all of that is tied to who we say we are through our mission statement and our four core commitments. All right, I don't, and I don't know if this is too widely off the subject, but I, 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 the feel to corn, I see this, I've read it, I understand what it means on a piece of paper, but what does it mean to you? What, what is the... Amid the alien corn. corn. Yes. What? What really? What really? Don't give me a, a scholastic, but a, I guess a personal, at least maybe your opinion view of what that actually means. It's it's a further validation that we should never underestimate the power of a seed. That from those humble beginnings, with absolutely no expectations of growth, let alone success, grew this wonderful congregation of Dominican Sisters of Adrian, Michigan, who for a variety of reasons were cast throughout the United States um, and have reaped such a rich harvest for the church. You know, who knew that from Radisbon to Second Street, New York, to Michigan, to that little hamlet of Adrian would come this incredibly gifted group of women with a major superior in Mother Gerald Barry who herself was not formally educated but insisted that these women get doctoral degrees so that they could hold their own in colleges and universities as members of faculty and who didn't feel that they could only go to Catholic colleges and universities, but sent them to state schools or secular independent schools because of the reputation and for the kind of education our women would get. Um, so mid the alien corn, who would have thought? <laughs> who would have thought? And, and that's kind of how I think about a lot of things. I, I really don't believe there are no accidents in the providence of God. That's something the Sisters of St. Joseph taught me. And I had them from third grade through high school. And why did I, you know, it's like 
I came to Barry because my father made a decision about our family life and the quality of life he wanted for us that was no longer attainable where we were living in New York. And his partner in their medical practice was his former student, 10 years younger than my father, who was Jewish and said to my father, you know, there's a Catholic college in Miami that, you know, maybe that's where Linda could go. And my father resigned his position at that Catholic hospital, actually two Catholic hospitals that he worked in, and he had his own private practice and was barely making a living. That We moved here for economic reasons. It's hard to believe. But my father resigned on March 19, 1957, the Feast of St. Joseph. I was educated by the Sisters of St. Joseph, and when I got the habit, my name was Sister Nora Michael of St. Joseph. And I just, the St. Joseph, they say, is the provider, the patron saint of families, of men who provide, if you will, for their families. And I just think all of that's not an accident because I frankly was looking at lots of other Northeastern women's colleges because that's where my girlfriends were all going. But we were moving here and everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people have heard me tell this story. I have found the right college for you, wrote my father because he came a year, a year ahead of us, so that I could finish my senior year of high school. He moved here and would come back and forth from Miami to New York so I could finish my senior year. I had a full scholarship, and he wrote me from Miami. I have found just the right school for you. It's run by Dominican nuns, and that's where you're going to college. Never saw the place till I came my first day as a freshman. Did you ever think to challenge him? No, I'd rather stay at home. What Italian girl does that in 1958? Nobody. <laughs> oldest, as I say, the oldest girl child in an Italian family. Back then it was, and I loved it from the minute I stepped for it. Someone said to me, I remember my first week here as a freshman, they said they thought I was a junior because I knew the whole place, you know, but I loved it. I loved it from the beginning. It's interesting. I have heard that from students just recently now say the same thing. I loved Barry from the minute I got here. And th that's what I think now we know is how important the fit is. That students, you know, in those days back then, 50, over 50 years ago, parents didn't have the ability to take their children to a variety of colleges and schools. And quite frankly, there were very real limitations on families. Back then, if you went to a Catholic high school, there was no way you were going to go to a secular institution. That's just the way it was. And then there was a limited number of women's colleges, for example, where families could afford. It wasn't that we were going to finishing schools. I mean, my father made it very clear that we were all going to college. Um, and they made enormous sacrifices for all of us to get. A college or a university degree, but it, it was that you didn't question, in a sense, what your parents wanted for you. And I think for my parents, yes, there were lots of schools I was looking at in Pennsylvania, in New York, in Connecticut, because that's where my friends were going. But the, we were moving to Miami, and that would have been just too far. Quite frankly, I'm not sure they could have afforded it either. So here, here I was. Look where the coin went. <laughs> <laughs> never, ever speaking. You, you mentioned before and asked you about the legacy. We haven't really touched on that yet. 
the diversity of their, which as you know, obviously you were here when it was an all girls, white, all girls Catholic college. Yes. Um, it, it was, it certainly was not as diverse as it is now. At the well, graduate really level, the, uh, well, the, the men were here in the graduate programs, that, but we didn't ever see them. I mean, at night we knew that there were some here, but, and in terms of the diversity, there probably were a few women who were from Central and South America, uh, Puerto Rico for sure, because we had in those days a two-year degree program in secretarial science. And so while Hispanic families would not have aspired that their daughter earn a four-year degree, there was a benefit to a young woman getting a two-year degree because, after all, she was going to marry a businessman. And it would be to his benefit that she would work in the office. I mean, this is the way it was put to me by or my classmates. that's how she'd meet a husband. Or, exactly, one or the other. And so we had friends who started with us as freshmen, but then they left after their sophomore year because they didn't come for the four-year degree, they came for the two-year degree. So the diversity was minimal. Um, in fact, I met our alum who was the first full-time African-American student, Cassie. I saw her. Uh, in the fall at Washington. I had a, a luncheon for graduates from Barry College, and she was one. And Sister Arnold and I have talked about her, because she actually came after me, but before my two sisters. So she was in the mid-60s. Uh, but Miami was very different then, too. I mean, I got on the bus right here on 2nd Avenue to go downtown and went and sat thinking nothing of it, and I wouldn't have. I was from New York. I sat in the back of the bus, and I realized I was the only Caucasian person sitting in the back of the bus. I mean, segregation was alive and well when our family moved here uh, in 1958. So the diversity grew with the evolution of the university. And I love who we are. I love the fact that we are part of an emerging global city with basically a global student body. I mean, we have students from everywhere here. Africa, the old Soviet <laughs> Socialist Republic. You know, we have, we have students from Central, South America, the Caribbean. It, it's wonderful. And I say to people that just because when you're walking around the campus, don't assume that a person of color is an African-American. <coughs> and don't assume that that student has one ethnic identity. Because our students are blended. Many of our students are now defining themselves as blended. Is Barry a better university with the diversity? I think it is. I think it is. That's not to say that, I mean, I find it, I find it um, jarring is a word I've used. I went to a meeting, a national meeting, and a local university provided the music for a liturgical celebration. And I'm sitting there, and I look at the choir, and I think, huh, that's not Barry. It, it, it jars. I mean, it's so jarring when you realize that you are looking at a group of people of one skin peg pigment, you know. And in the middle of this group was an Oriental student, one Oriental student in the midst. 
And so I, I know that that's not what I'm used to or even now where I'm comfortable. I, I enjoy our diversity. I, I guess for some people, they might feel out of place in the same way that I now do when I'm not in our context or in our environment. So I think it is, I think it's enriching. I don't know if it's better, Connie, but it, it clearly is, it's, it's, a, it's an enriching and enlivening environment. And I say to the freshmen, you know, when you think about your future, this is your reality right here. You are now global citizens. I was not a global citizen as a, as a student in college. I wasn't a global citizen in the 70s when I worked here. But now we all are, but they are going to have much more experience either in their living and in their working, being part of a, of a global society. I think that's good for them. I tell them, you know, what a shame if you graduate from here and you haven't gotten into the mind and the heart, you know, of a student from a very different culture. What do they eat? How do they celebrate? What are their holidays? You know, what's the family tradition? So. And I think our students do appreciate, especially the millennials. I, I think for them, this is, they know it's their reality. I just get a quick question from Adam. Because I'm afraid I'm going to cough some more. I hope I'm not. What, is there something I haven't asked or you think we should? I'd like to pick up on a few things. And it'll feel repetitive, but if you don't mind going deeper. Um, but you have to answer to me. Yeah, you She'll ask, but her, yeah, but I'm going <laughs> to answer to me. No one's um, said to Sister Linda very often. <laughs> right, right. Um, so this is new. This question we haven't really talked about, but it's going to lead into some. Um, so we talk about the Dominican charism here at Berry in our programming, which calls us to respond to the times and to see a need and work to fill it. What role and responsibility do you see for Berry in the future to, to respond to the times we face today? as a university, but most especially as a Catholic Dominican university, part of our being faithful is to read the signs of the times, uh, to help our students have the capacity to do that, to be able to analyze them from a variety of perspectives, and then to determine the most appropriate responses. I think a lot of that is what we try to do in service learning, in the what's going to be the QEP, the um, hands-on learning experiences. All of that we do now when we take our students to service projects. This is not a, about putting a Band-Aid on something. This is about understanding why do certain members of our society not enjoy the same privileges and benefits and that, that we do. So what does it, why are underserved populations underserved? So for us, it's part of the educative process so that when our students are participating in service engagement, there's study that goes on before, and there's a reflection when they come back. Because at the heart of our education around some of those systemic challenges that we face as society has to be an understanding of the root causes of inequality or injustice, and then what are, the, what are the actions that we can take, especially those of us who've had the benefit of formal education? 
helping students understand what social activism means, helping them understand the political process, helping them to get comfortable with, um, with taking a stand for what they believe in. And I I don't know that any Catholic college or university could really claim faithfulness if, if they don't continue to do that. You know, for us as Catholic, it flows out of the gospel imperative. You know, what do the Beatitudes call us? Who do, what do they call us to be? Because it's about who we are, who we are as persons, who we are as a university community. That, that's really important to me. That we're creating a community here. I guess that would be, when you asked me earlier about a legacy, it's hard, it's hard to talk about a legacy, but you know, I hope that I've helped create a community here. I never call Barry a family. These are not parental units and children. I'm nobody's mother, but I'm part of a community. I was asked by a search firm to consider the presidency of a state university. I said, with all due respect, I haven't a shred of interest in doing that. To me, it is not being a president of an entity. I want to be part of a community where I'm nourished for who I am and where I can bring life out of who I am to that community. I want my values and the values of the institution to be congruent. And so for me, I can't conceive of not being in a Catholic university or college. And I would want to ensure that my leadership is helping to create a vibrant, engaged, knowledgeable, faithful community. I see sort of an analogy here between when we did talk about the legacies. You're creating a community here that's going to go out, you hope, into the broader community. Oh. And do what they're, you know, do their activism or their responsibility. So Absolutely. There's, there's, there's a chain here. There's a theme here. And that's what we say. You know, it may, it, because you hear it so often, it just may go right over your head. But, you know, we try to say that to every graduating class. I mean, whether we call on the banners of learn, reflect, serve, or we, 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 our hope is that what our students experienced here continues to nourish them and empower them so that they continue that learning, reflection, and service. This is not just for the years that you're a student. We're responsible for graduating society's future leaders. Whether that's leadership in your place of work, in your neighborhood, it can be a locus this small, it can be a locus this big. I think actually to follow up on that, Sister Pat, you reminded me of something she was talking about because she talked about global citizenship. Absolutely. And for our students, that's a big part of their future. And, um, and we learned a lot about our environmental part for our service, and I think Pat in particular is focused on that. So if you could maybe think of one or two things that our students should do you know, what is their obligation for service in their futures beyond Barry when we, when they leave here as, you know, rep reflective of our mission? Is there Not just necessarily environmental. No. You know, that no. Be, but that's that's what what is, yeah. I, I, first of all, I think you, um, individuals can find a niche anywhere. There are so many unmet needs in society that, are given expression by the people, starting with children, who, whose circumstances have prevented them from enjoying some of life's basic 
rights. I mean, the studies are voluminous about the ability of a child to succeed given what happened to them before kindergarten. If a student child comes unprepared in kindergarten, it is almost impossible that they ever catch up to the student who comes prepared. How shocking that a three-year-old is going to... Well, when, this is, I was telling one of our students who came to interview me about what it was like to be an education major and my student teaching when I was a student. And I said to her, when I started teaching first grade, I taught children colors, I taught children the alphabet, I taught children to write their name. I have grandnieces and nephews who were doing that at two and a half and three. Sophia could recognize her name at three. She knew the letters of her name. She went to pre-K knowing her alphabet, her colors, the whole thing. But there are still children who don't have that as part of their, their upbringing. And, and so I think students, I think young adults, anybody, can find a place to share their gifts with those who are in need whether you go the environmental route or you go direct service, whether it's volunteering. I, I have to believe that our students will continue to do that. I have a classic example. I, went, I was on the board of Habitat for Humanity and we had an event, this is a few years ago, and at the event we were thanking our volunteers who had worked with Habitat. And a young woman came up to me and she said, oh, Sister Linda, I've never met you. I graduated before you were our president. And she said, um, I just wanted to meet you. And I said, well, what are you doing here? And she said, oh, I, I do some pro bono work and I, I volunteer for Habitat. And I said, oh, well, thank you for doing that. I said, we're so dependent on people like you. And I said, um, what do you do? And I'm a lawyer. And I said, oh, I said, is your law firm part of, of what you do? And she said, oh no. She said, in fact, I was walking out the door one, out of the office one day and one of the um, junior partners with me said, where are you going? And I said, oh, I'm going over to Habitat. You know, I do some work for them. And, and he said to me, oh, is that billable? And she said, no, it's pro bono. And he said to her, why would you do that? And she looked at him and she says to me, I said to him, it's very obvious you didn't graduate from Barry. So I just think yeah. that, you know, that's one of probably thousands of <laughs> stories. Roxanne, I think you've got more. So Sister Linda, picking up on that theme of seeing a need and working to fill it, can you go back to the metaphor of the alien corn because Adam actually shot the corn early one morning and we're gonna to transition to the swamplands of Miami. So we wanted a little bit more about um, that impetus to, to create um, a Catholic girls' school in the South. What, what was going on there for the sisters in that spirit and using the corn metaphor, if you can come up with anything. Well, I don't know that I can get into the heads of the berries. Yeah, I mean, you know. Um, or just the, the need to found, found, found a Catholic girl's school in the South. Well, like then yes. say that to her. I mean, tell yeah. her. Well, they, well, I no, mean, I'm sure some more. of the other, um, didn't any of the, other, the older sisters talk to that? We yes. learned a lot about uh, Mother Gerald. But yeah, we were it was really in. Mother Gerald and Bishop Barry yes. because mm -hmm. as I understand it, there wasn't, there wasn't a school, they would have said, a school 
for girls. I mean, you can see how our language has evolved. I mean, we don't call them girls, but they would have said there wasn't a school for girls or a college for young women, South Catholic College, south of the Mason-Dixon line. For the young women who came from ordinary working class Catholic families. Roxanne, what you're looking for is, is some sort of more of a metaphor. Well, because we do have that. Some I'm talking about Mother Hubbard. Or, and her, I mean, Mother Hubbard. And we had thought about the alien corn. Your, your education yeah, is yeah, tough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we thought that the alien corn was um, itself such a powerful metaphor. And it seems to be the metaphor. Well, it wasn't. It. Now, it's not a metaphor. Well, it's direct. Oh, tell us. Because, well, no, I mean, in this sense. The beginning the, was casual. The Start beginning there. was casual. The first sentence. Um, no, I mean, I think she used, that was Sister Mary Philip Ryan, right? Yeah. Oh, you have it right yeah. there. It was, I guess, when they looked at the Midwest back then. It, it was, I mean, Adrian was a massive cornfield because it was a farming town. It's the reason why so you will find very many second and third generation Mexican families in Adrian. Why there's there are great little Mexican restaurants because those first generation um, workers came up from Texas, came through the center of the country, and would come to Michigan to work the fields, whether it was so the corn or the cherries or the Adrian was in the Midwest, a farming community in general. She it was, was just, inspired by the cornfields. Oh, I absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think that's why she came up with the title. Mm -hmm. uh, Go from there, but because really, they came from, well, I mean, we can trace our roots, as you know. You saw the tree. So whether it's Regensburg or Radisbon, First Pruy, Regensburg, Radisbon, um, Second Street, New York, and then, what's that one in Michigan? Begins with an M. Um, yeah, Traverse City. Traverse City. And then they came down to Adrian. I think for her, amid the alien corn, um, yeah, I, I mean, I can see how you're making the connection to the swamps Florida. of Florida, except yeah. this wasn't swampland. This is considered highland, by the way, yes. because the, when I was a student here, the back 40, which was from the library on, was filled with Florida pine trees. And wherever you have pine trees in Florida, it's higher land. Because so this is not Everglades land. Mm. This, uh, but if you think about how undeveloped it was, and the Adrian sisters have been in Florida, had been in Florida long before the ground was broken here. We were in West Palm Beach in the 20s. But it also is why we went to places like Solon, North Dakota, Roy, New Mexico, Henderson, Nevada. I mean, we went to these places, and I don't know if any of the other sisters told you the story, because the Bishop of Detroit favored another group of sisters. And so when a parish was being formed, when the Catholic Church was forming a parish and building a school, he gave preference to these other sisters. And so Mother Gerald had no choice. And because her brother had, was a bishop, he knew lots of bishops, and they knew him, and they thought nothing of writing her a letter and asking, would you send three sisters? Would you send four sisters? Could you staff our school? And she always said yes. And that's why we became a national congregation as contrasted with, say, the Sisters of Mercy, whom I worked for when I was president of Gwynedd Mercy. They are a Philadelphia group. Their vocations came from Philadelphia, by and large, not 100%. But they couldn't believe when I would tell them that I had been 
to visit our sisters in Arizona, and I went to New Mexico, and I went to Arizona, I mean to Nevada, and then I went to California, and we have hundreds and hundreds in Chicago, and then we are in the Mid-Atlantic. That was a new concept to them, a new reality of being a congregation, whereas for us, it's all we ever knew. So part of that was that Mother Gerald was a woman of the church. There was a need that was expressed. She had women who could help fill the need. She said, yes, sisters, you will go. You will go. That's what we wanted. That was that, wanted. that, was that transition. Yeah. You really wanted um, that. We didn't get into. Um, Sister Linda, um, Barry no. transitioned from a college to a university in 1981. Can you? You should. I would prefer that, that you had talked to Sister Jean about well, we that. Did. We did. Okay, I mean, yeah. look, the fact of the matter is at Sister Jean's inauguration, she stood up and announced it. Okay. Oh, we have her talk about it. We just wanted to see if there was anything more to say. And also about transition from, we talk about it with every interview um, from. Oh, that's nine, 1975. Now that I was here for. Yeah, yes. Okay, no. Yes, uh, and I mean, we got the impression that it had already sort of been happening in the summer. It had, well, it had been, ha no, it had been happening during the year. Bec now, this is a long story. Do you really want this? Uh, short, short okay. Sweet. Well, all right. So the thing. fact of the matter is, at the undergraduate level, we, some, were, some a single, we were a single-sex institution. Then when the Cuban Revolution took place, the Augustinian fathers had to leave Cuba and brought their university over here. The bishop at the time gave them the land over there in Miami Gardens, and it was named Biscayne College because in Cuba it was Santo Tomas de Velo Nueve. All right, so it was the same Augustinian fathers who also founded Villanova outside of Philadelphia. And they obviously did not want another Villanova. So it was, saying, it was Biscayne College. Biscayne College was a men's college. And over time, they had majors that Barry wasn't offering, and we had majors they weren't offering. So in the end, to make a very long story short, we created the Barry Biscayne Consortium. And I actually chaired that board when I was in student affairs. And so we ran a shuttle bus between Biscayne and Barry. And there was a place the bus stopped. The students who had classes at Biscayne would travel. And the students from Biscayne who had classes at Barry traveled. So for example, students who wanted to study accounting, they would go over there. Students who wanted theater or music or languages came over here. It became very clear that many of the young men wanted their degrees from Barry. And so in the early 70s, the conversation got started. But it wasn't until 1975 uh, that the board made the decision to fully admit undergraduate men to the college. And we decided that they would be housed across the street at the villa. The villa had been an honors house for students in the honors program, which was a rather large at that time. And so when I was dean of students, that's where we housed our first group of undergraduate men. Was there negative reaction to that? Did parents say, I'm pulling my daughter out? I thought I would. No, I don't remember any of that. Was it the opposite? Was it, well, this is wonderful. This is, you know, this is moving on with the times. This is looking forward. I think there was an appreciation that, um, that it had evolved, if you will, and that it was a good decision. I remember, um, you know, and I'm a graduate of the Women's College, I don't remember feeling that Barry was losing its essence because we were becoming co-ed. It, like, it seemed like a 
purposeful and rational and almost appropriate decision for us at that time.